This is Thursday, October 9th, 2014. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morris Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan. Our cameraman is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus. And we are privileged to have with us today Liam Walsh. Welcome, Liam. Thanks for having me. Thank you for coming. May I ask when you were born? I was born on November 15th, 1982. And where were you born? Uh, Greenfield, Massachusetts. And what town do you currently live in? I currently reside in Somerville, Massachusetts. Your marital status? I am single. And tell us what Greenfield was like growing up. It was a nice, quiet area to grow up. I enjoyed high school playing sports, not that big of uh, area, so a lot of friends that you're pretty close with from you know, the you know, elementary school through high school. Uh, looking back, it was a very nice way to grow up. So, Did any members of your family take part in the military? Uh, my grandfather served, uh, he was enlisted prior to World War II, went over to Europe, uh, fought in the Battle of the Bulge, and then stayed in at Fort Devens, I believe, for about a decade after the war and then got out in the mid-50s. And then I have some uncles that did brief stints after high school, but really other than my grandfather, he was the only one who had a sort of military career. And what year did you graduate high school? I graduated from high school in 2001. And where did you graduate? Graduated from uh, Ralph C. Mahar High School in Orange, Massachusetts. Okay. And I understand you did a year of prep. Yes, I went to New Mexico Military Institute in Roswell, New Mexico for a year uh, for prep school to go to West Point and then entered West Point in uh, July of 2002. Why West Point? Um, it's a world-class education. Uh, I kind of realized that in high school, you know, the, the leadership uh, development that comes out of the uh, West Point is you know, second to none. Uh, it's, I knew that I wanted to serve, so the five-year obligation uh, for your time at, in education at West Point wasn't something that really concerned me. Uh, so it, it made sense at the time, and I'm glad it was one of the best decisions of my life to, to go to West Point. Tell us what going to West Point was like. It's demanding. Um, you know, I had done the prep year in New Mexico, which was a military institute, so I was kind of used to balancing academics with uh, military lifestyle, but the, the academics at West Point were extremely demanding. The structure on your day, you know, from the time you get up at around you know, five or six in the morning through midnight or later doing homework, every minute of the day is regimented between classes, athletics, um, military drill and ceremony, so it's you literally have every second of the day pretty much allocated, which doesn't leave a lot of time for anything other than you know what West Point has for you. So it gets better as the, the four years go on, you get more privileges and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But it, especially the, the first two years were incredibly demanding. The first year, because as they, they call the freshmen their plebes, you're responsible for you know, all kinds of shenanigans, if you will, to kind of learn how to deal under pressure. And then the second year, actually, I thought the academics were incredibly demanding, probably the hardest year academically for me. So uh, it was it was definitely challenging, a worthwhile challenge, but challenging nonetheless. Did you uh, specialize during your years in West Point? So I majored in uh, military history, actually, um, which is something that's always interesting to me. Growing up you know, as a as a kid, I liked uh, the Civil War a lot, so military history was always something I enjoyed, and I found it to be a very rewarding um, experience. Uh, studying that, especially when I did my, my senior thesis, I uh, participated and looked at a study of the early U.S. Army involvement in the Vietnam War and ended up doing a lot of oral history. Uh, interestingly enough, you know, here we are years mm -hmm. later, but you know, kind of gained an appreciation through you know, mostly phone interviews, but listening to people tell their stories of this you know, generation prior to uh, what I'd be going into uh, you know, when I graduated in 2006 with the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And that is, of course, when you graduated from West Point in 2006. Six. Yes. The wars in the Middle East were well underway. Tell us what happened as soon as you got your commission. So I commissioned <clears throat> and I went down to Fort Benning, Georgia um, for what the, uh, at the time the Army was running this, uh, it was called Basic Officer Leader Course. It was kind of the short-lived attempt to make all the officers of various branches go to almost a basic training, but not hard getting yelled at mm -hmm. basic training, more of regardless of your specialty, everyone learns the same skills. 
and then I stayed at Fort Benning to do my specialty training as an infantry officer, the infantry officer basic course. Uh, so I was at Fort Benning for those two courses. I believe that was um, August 2006 through about f January or February 2007. And then upon completing the infantry officer basic course, I went to ranger school at Fort Benning as well. So I ended up spending almost a year uh, in training at Fort Benning after I graduated from West Point mm -hmm. um, between the basic officer leader course, the infantry officer basic course, and ranger school. So um, that was, uh, you know, for me, my first experience uh, with the Army post West Point, and then went to my first duty assignment, uh, which is at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. Tell us a little more about ranger school. Uh, ranger school was the most difficult thing I've ever done in my life. Uh, it's a 62-day 62 62 course um, where you know, if you, you strip everything away from it, you basically don't eat or sleep for about 62 days while conducting simulated combat operations. And it's really the Army views it as its premier uh, leadership course. You're not really learning that difficult tactics, but you're having to deal with people that are incredibly tired, hungry. You know, the weather, I was there kind of end of winter and then the beginning of uh, the spring summer time frame and you're in pretty bad terrain you know you start at Fort Benning then you go up to the uh, the mountains in North Georgia and then the last phase you go down to the swamps in the panhandle of Florida so there's a lot of challenges there and you know pretty much everyone reaches their breaking point um, and it's you get selected for leadership positions throughout the course so you just get your number called hey you know roster number 18 you're the platoon leader now you have to plan the operation carry everything out and you're graded on how well you do in these leadership positions. Uh, and then, unlike most other schools in the Army Ranger School, also you're graded by peer evaluations. So even if you pass all of your patrols, um, at the end of every phase, your squad gets together and they rank everybody in the squad. So if you get, essentially if you get peered close to the bottom, if all your peers rate you close to the bottom of your squad, you'll actually get dropped from the course. Um, so it shouldn't, even if you're in great physical condition, but you're not looking out for everyone around, you know, people see through that, which I thought was a very interesting aspect of Ranger School uh, because they actually take peer feedback into the criteria for people making it through the course. Mm. Um, so that was, I learned a lot about myself and I think just about human nature during my time there. You realize you're not nearly as tough uh, as you think you are and everyone has a breaking point. And also that, you know, you can get people to get through pretty much anything. Uh, working together and applying leadership um, into that, so. While you were at uh, Fort Benning and then Fort Campbell, did you ever have a thought in the back of your mind that you might be sent overseas? Oh yes, it was going back to, to West Point. Um, you know, I was there, I think it was spring break my freshman year when the war in Iraq started. And it was interesting uh, as a cadet at West Point to initially think, oh, hey, we missed this war, you know, Iraq fell in a month or so, and it was like, oh, we missed this. And then you started to see over the course of 2003 through 2004, 2005, as the situation started to get worse. Uh, and then, you know, I will always remember uh, when I was at West Point, whenever a graduate would get killed, they'd make an announcement in the mess hall uh, during breakfast or dinner when we had one of our mandatory meals. And you remember the first time it happened and then it started happening more and more frequently to the point where it was, you know, at least once a week um, in the height of the war. So it was interesting, you know, going from being a freshman thinking, oh, we missed the war, because at that time Afghanistan didn't have that much of a U.S. involvement, to graduating in 2006 when it was arguably getting at its worst period and realizing you're going to go over there. You know, people you had known had already gone over there. Uh, some folks that I had known had gone over there and been killed. So it was this transformation during my time there. So I think that made the training at Fort Benning uh, all the more, you realize you're gonna come out of here and as an infantry officer, go be a platoon leader. So you need to learn what you're supposed to learn in this training. Cause there's stories of you know, West Point grads in other branches that don't have as long of a, a training period. I had friends that while I was still an infantry officer basic course, they were in Iraq you know, six months after graduation. Uh, so you realize you know, that it, this is very real and likely happening. And then when I got orders to go to the 101st Airborne at Fort Campbell, it was well known that they were going to deploy to Iraq in the summer, fall time frame of 2007. So I knew, uh, you know, when I got done with Ranger School, I, some, you'll see some uh, lieutenants at Fort Benning will try to 
hang around Fort Benning for a while and go to different schools and kind of just mess around for a month or two. I got done with Ranger School and wanted to get to Fort Campbell as quickly as possible uh, to try to get a platoon to be a platoon leader and uh, then to, you know, train that unit up prior to, to going to Iraq. Now you're at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. It's around 2007? Yep, I got to Fort Campbell in June 2007. And you were, you have been assigned to be a platoon leader. Yep, I was a platoon leader with Delta Company, uh, 1st Battalion, 502nd Infantry Regiment in the 101st Airborne Division, 2nd Brigade. So what were your duties? Um, I was responsible, a Delta Company in the 101st Airborne is a, it's actually a weapons company. So you'll have three rifle companies and a weapons company. The rifle company platoons are around 40 soldiers. The weapons company platoons are more around 18 soldiers. But at the time, the weapons companies, uh, I believe the, the structure is still this way, they were, whereas a light infantry unit's built basically on guys with their rifles and what they can carry on their back, the weapons companies were based off of uh, Humvee gun trucks with 50 caliber machine guns or Mark 19s. And they were designed, or, and then uh, tow missiles, which is an anti-tank missile system. So the, the design was, uh, this was the anti-tank company that would augment the other companies in a conventional fight against you know, the Russians or someone like that when this was designed back in, I think, the late 70s, early 80s. So it was a smaller platoon, and my primary duties and responsibilities were, you know, you're responsible for the health welfare of all your soldiers, uh, the training and readiness, uh, physical and tactically, of those guys. And, you know, but when I got there in June, it was pretty fast. I got there, we went out to Fort Knox, Kentucky, uh, which is a pretty short drive away from Fort Campbell, to do some uh, platoon level training. Um, within, I think by August, we went down to Fort Polk for uh, what the Army does as a mission re rehearsal exercise at one of the major training centers. So our whole brigade went down to Fort Polk to basically do our validation tr final training event before going to Iraq. And um, where is Fort Polk? Louisiana. Somewhere in Louisiana. So we were down there in August of 2007, which was a pretty hot place. Uh, and that was, you know, it's a counter, we were doing counterinsurgency based uh, training, trying to prepare uh, the whole brigade, but, you know, I was focused on my platoon and uh, what we were doing on going to Iraq. So, you know, I got there in June, that took me through September, and then I went to Iraq in October. And there was, a, I think, somewhere in there, there was about a month worth of leave before we went. So I really didn't get to know Fort Campbell too well uh, before I went to Iraq. During the training, did you receive reports about the Humvees getting nailed by IEDs? By 2007, they had done a pretty good job at uh, replacing, the, you know, the non-armored Humvees were completely gone, and then the level, uh, the generation upgrade of the armor packages on the Humvees had gotten better. Uh, and, you know, I was in my platoon, the majority of the non-commissioned officers were there in the invasion of Iraq in 2003, and then they had also gone back in a deployment 2005, 2006, which was a very, uh, they had a pretty rough deployment that time, a lot of fighting down in the, uh, let's call it the Triangle of Death south of Baghdad. So you'd heard from these NCOs, you know, kind of the evolution from, you know, speeding into Baghdad in an unarmored vehicle sitting on sandbags to, you know, well then we had armored vehicles, but they were still getting blown up. So um, we knew we'd be getting armored Humvees in Iraq when we got there. Uh, and then, so I think a lot of those concerns had gone by um, from you know, the previous, especially 2003, 2004, early concerns uh, of the invasion mm -hmm. when they didn't go with that type of force. And prior to going to Iraq, did you and your unit receive any training in cultural aspects? We did. Um, I know my battalion, all the lieutenants actually sat down with a lot of uh, or I shouldn't say a lot, but they had a few uh, Iraqi expats, and we would do, uh, we call them engagements, but you know, basically key leader engagements, talking with uh, these Iraqis who would be playing the role of a mayor or a sheikh or a police chief. So the, the leadership, the platoon leaders actually did that, and it got me, you, you actually had the experience talking through a translator, you know, some of the, the cultural norms as far as greeting and handshakes and that you'd experience in Iraq, and then Especially at Fort Polk, it was definitely uh, it was definitely ro rotated into the training there. You know, they did their best to replicate uh, civilians on the battlefield, 
And although most of them were you know, paid American contractors who didn't speak Arabic, you know, they were still, you're having to deal with as you're trying to secure a square or a meeting or something, you're dealing with people that are upset because you know, the power is not working or because another unit had you know, run over a dog or killed a child. And so these situations were thrown into the training. And I thought it did a pretty good job of getting us prepared uh, as much as you could get prepared to go over to Iraq. I mean, this was 2007 as well, so I mean, you had roughly four years of trial and error within the Army to kind of figure it out and get it right. Um, so although I don't think anything can ever fully prepare you for what you're going to experience there when you, know, you end up ultimately in Baghdad, where I was, um, you know, I think we did a very good job uh, on preparing. And then also having the experience of a lot of the soldiers who had been there two times, at least once. You know, it's interesting when you come in as a new lieutenant, I had never been over before, and you'd have some brand new privates, but everyone that had been in for at least two years had been to Iraq at least once, if not twice. Uh, so you got a lot of experience from those guys that had been there and done that before. All right, you're a lieutenant, and you are you're been deployed to Iraq. Tell us what happened. Uh, so we initially, we deployed at the tail end of the surge. Um, so. You know, you had the five brigades surge into Baghdad. So one of the, the initial challenges was that uh, the, we call it tactical infrastructure, but the, the smaller bases that uh, units were living on were just, it was so crammed because they hadn't had the time to build things up. So initially, uh, our battalion sector was down in northwest Baghdad um, in a series of neighborhoods uh, around Kadamiya. Uh, but we were originally based out of Camp Taji, my platoon was, which was about eh, 15, 20 miles north of Baghdad. Uh, so we'd have to do that drive in and out of town uh, every day. And I started off the deployment. Um, my platoon was tasked to do the, uh, called per the Personal Security Detachment, PSD, for our battalion commander. Uh, so, you know, in olden times, pre-2003, uh, when we didn't fight as much asymmetrically, you know, the way that the, the Army organized units is, you know, the battalion commander and the sergeant major who are in charge of these organizations, you know, they had their Humvee and they would drive around and go between units and, you know, you could move a vehicle theoretically, you know, fighting a high intensity conflict behind the lines and go between your front lines. Well, in Iraq, that obviously stopped happening. So they had to create, you know, basically a platoon had to move with them because you're not going to be able to drive around with just one truck. So my platoon, uh, worked with my battalion commander, and he was very active in going out and uh, engaging with um, uh, Iraqi army, Iraqi police uh, officials, his subordinate company commanders, uh, seeing the platoons out there. So we stayed really busy coming down from Camp Taji into Baghdad, back and forth. Uh, and I think we, we were keeping a tally um, when we were based up at Taji in the first few months of the deployment, and we had put on, you know, within two months, I think well over a thousand miles of driving through Baghdad, which you know it's it's 20 miles really. It was you know here to to Somerville, but we're just going back and forth and through the area uh, so much. And uh, so principally, what I would do would be most of the the route planning because we wouldn't want to set predictable routes into where we were going. I do the command and control of our uh, our vehicles patrol. So we usually moved initially. We would drive in three gun truck patrols. Uh, they upped the requirement to make it four. So we'd move around in about four trucks. Um, and as I had mentioned earlier, my platoon had, being a, a Delta Company weapons platoon, they actually were familiar with driving Humvees before. So that worked out. They were pretty good at the operational employment of, uh, of vehicles, whereas some of the, the rifle infantry companies weren't as good because they just didn't train on vehicles as much. Um, but we went and a lot of what I would do would be, uh, we would go to, you know, neighborhood meetings uh, and our platoon would set up security around the meeting and you know, we'd send a few soldiers in to make sure that, you know, it was safe uh, where Colonel McLam, my commander, was meeting, but then we'd also pull the outside security. Um, and so it is either between that or just going out and visiting units on patrol. I did that, I mean, ultimately, I did the, the PSD bit for, I got there in October 07 and I think I switched platoons in, uh, July, June or July of 2008 when we were over there. Um, so it was very rewarding though, I found, because since I was riding with our battalion commander all the time, I had a much better appreciation for the bigger picture of what was going on in our battalion sector. You know, when I would go and visit my friends uh, that were in Delta Company, the other platoon leaders I had trained up with, 
you know, they wouldn't have nearly as granular an understanding of what we were trying to do as an organization in partnering with the Iraqi army, with why certain emphases were, you know, this neighborhood versus another neighborhood. And since I was with the battalion commander day in and day out, I got this, I, I got insight into what he was thinking, which is something I've been, I think, blessed for my whole career because he was an incredibly intelligent officer and a great leader. And I think I learned a lot from just seeing what he did um, and how he interacted with soldiers, how he thought through complex problems. Um, but it definitely gave me a much better understanding of this is the big picture of what we're trying to do in our area of Northwest Baghdad, as opposed to later on in the deployment when I moved and took over. I stayed with Delta Company, but went to a different platoon. You know, I was concerned with uh, neighborhoods in Baghdad are called mahalas. So, you know, there'd be small areas and you know, I was responsible for three or four mahalas. And, you know, that became your world. And you thought that, you know, that was the only thing that mattered was what was right there. And if you only had more resources, you could win the war and you know, all these great things. And I kind of lost sight of that bigger picture understanding I had when I did the, uh, the PSD gig with my battalion commander for the first part of the deployment. And how did you find the, the locals? Baghdad was very interesting. I mean, I, I really liked Baghdad. So Northwest Baghdad, where I was, was predominantly Shia. Um, our base where we stayed um, was right outside the Qadamiya Shrine, which is, I think, the third most holy site in Shia Islam. Uh, so it was interesting because that neighborhood, Qadamiya, a lot of the buildings, you're talking, you know, the shrine was built in 13-something. Uh, the buildings were at least three, 400 years old. And it was this maze of uh, just old, narrow streets and alleys that made no sense uh, when you were walking through there with your patrols. And the people, I thought, by 2007, the vast majority of the Iraqis I dealt with in Baghdad had, however bad it was under Saddam Hussein, they had had some semblance of uh, a relatively modern life compared to what I later experienced in Afghanistan. So they knew, by 2007, the common sentiment I would see was, you know, we understand that you Americans aren't here trying to occupy the country. You're here to try to help us. We wish you, our government would do the same thing and you know, help us help ourselves because we're just sick of you know, the, the criminals essentially at this point in time. Uh, we're sick of their interference with what we're doing. We want things to be safe. Uh, you know, there was a fair amount, um, if you look at the, the history of the Iraq war, you have the, you know, the surge begins in late 2006, early 2007. You have this sharp spike in violence until about August September 2007. I got there in October 2007, and then there was this big drop off of violence. Uh, so we had what would, you know, we'd look at almost breathing room to work on development projects to, to try to boost up the local economy. And I thought my experience with the locals I dealt with in Northwest Baghdad, they were pretty grateful that we were there. We would go out on, uh, you know, evening patrols and just walk through some of the markets. You know, you get invited into restaurants. Um, They'd you know, they'd go have you know some food, talk, you know, talk with you, um, and seemed. You know, I learned a lot of interesting things just you know walking around talking with people. Uh, there was obviously, I think you ran into a lot of what we call military age males, but young unemployed men that were. That would be where you kind of get you know mean looks, um, and you know whether or not they were working for the insurgency or the criminal groups in the area, don't really know. But I think that the vast majority of the folks that we talked with were, I don't want to sound, you know, all, everything was perfect, but they understood that we were trying to help. Um, and their frustration generally had to do with their own government and their own security forces um, for not holding up their end of the bargain. Uh, that was, I mean, that's at least what I experienced talking with people. Maybe they meant other things, but. While you were on patrol, were you always in full battle gear? Yes. Um, so the majority of the time when I was, the, my first half of the deployment when I was doing uh, the personal little security detachment, we spent most time driving around in Humvees, but we were wearing our body armor, our helmet, you know, fireproof gloves, bulletproof uh, eyeglasses, our weapons and whatnot. And we would, you can fit, the, you know, there's a pretty small patrol. The Humvee only sits uh, when you drive or TC, you can get five people in a Humvee, but the gunner and the driver never get out, so you can only take three guys out of it. So if you're moving four vehicles, you're only putting, what's that, about you know, nine people, nine to 12 on the ground. 
Uh, so it's a pretty small organization. They move in through the area we were in, Cotamia. I think the population is roughly 500,000 people in this one small nook of Baghdad. Um, so we always wore our protective equipment. Our commander was a pretty big stickler on it. You know, these are the rules. Good units do the right thing because that's what good units do is kind of one of his you know, mantras. Um, when I moved to the second uh, platoon leader job I had, we did a lot more. Uh, the Mahalas we were in charge of were right outside of our base. So we would just walk out the gate a lot and go walk through the community. Um, and we found we did a lot of patrolling in the very early morning hours. Um, you know, three, four o'clock into basically through sunrise because it would just get hot. And there were days there, I think we hit 125, 130, um, you know, degrees Fahrenheit. And you're wearing your stuff, you know, it's 70, 80 pounds of equipment. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't breathe well, it's, it's very hot. So um, that was what, you know, we would go out when we walked. At the same time, when I had shifted over to my second platoon leader job, we had just started fielding the, the MRAPs, the mine resisted ambush protected vehicles, so the much larger, uh, essentially what were supposed to be IED proof vehicles that Secretary Gates had pushed so hard to get to the troops, which were good in a lot of ways in that the ones we had, you could fit so many more people in the back because we would find tactically, if you're moving a Humvee, you can only fit uh, three dismounts in. There's only so many people you could put, say, if you're doing a raid on an objective. Whereas with the MRAPs, we, some of the ones we had, I think you could fit nine or 10 in the back. So we'd have one platoon drive us out. All our guys would pack in one of these, I mean, we call them school buses. They'd drop us off at a place, and then we could do what we needed to do without having to worry about And they'd leave with the trucks and go do their own thing. Uh, so that was you know, very, uh, it was a big force multiplier, I think, when it comes to the protection that we had uh, with, with the MRAPs. Um, and that was about, we got them pretty early on. I mean, I think within the first few months of move, coming into country, we started getting MRAPs uh, within our battalion. Because I was doing PSD with my battalion commander, he refused to take MRAPs until the rest of the battalion had been fielded them because he's like, I don't want to be driving around with these things if my soldiers don't have them. So we were actually the last platoon to go to MRAPs uh, and stayed in Humvees the longest. And how do you spell that? It's just M-R-A-P. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It stands for Mine Resisted resistant ambush protected. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're essentially the large hulking V-hulk vehicles. And the idea was, you know, you had the flat bottom Humvees, and when you had a under, an IED underneath the ground explode, the flat bottom did not deal with that very well uh, in most cases. The MRAP, since it was higher off the ground with the V-shape, it deflected the blast. And they had a, they're much heavier, much bigger. One of the challenges we had with them is, and they sit, I think, about 12 feet tall. And a lot of Baghdad, you have very old uh, telephone wires, internet wires running over, and you go driving through, and these things are so high, you know, the turret or the antennas will get caught. Uh, so, you know, our soldiers are smart. They would just take PVC piping and make like this guide, we call them. So when you drive through, it just guide the, the wires over the vehicles, because people would go, you know, this, they're relying on, you know, their TV cables and their internet and power, and you're tearing their wires and their livelihood down. So we didn't have that problem with the Humvees. The MRAPs came and was like, ooh, this is a problem. It, they were still an issue where we were at in Baghdad because a lot of the streets were just so old that you couldn't fit driving in a lot of places. Even the Humvees didn't fit in a lot of the streets. So we got pretty good as far as knowing the area where you could and couldn't go with trucks, uh, where you had to get out, start walking. And when I was in my second platoon leader job, you know, we walked pretty much everywhere we went. Um, but again, that comes at the cost of you're wearing a lot of very heavy, uh, hot equipment. So, yeah. So um, when you were on your first deployment to Baghdad, were you ever in the line of fire? Uh, yes, we had, um, that deployment was in our, in our area, as far as uh, kinetic firefight activity, we only had one period in uh, March of 2008. There was, um, I said earlier, we were in a Shia area and most of the Shia militias rose up in the end of March of 2008 based off of uh, Prime Minister Maliki made a push on a Shia stronghold in southern Baghdad. Uh, the Shia militias essentially rose up throughout the country. So our area, they rose up. And there was about a week-long period where it was pretty consistent firefights uh, with these Shia militias. Um, and it's interesting, when you, you look at the composition of those militias, how much of them were criminal, how many of them were you know, Iranian-backed uh, extremists. Um, 
So there was that period, and then the, the constant threat that we dealt with our entire deployment was, uh, you know, because that week that we were getting shot at, we, the U.S. forces never took any casualties that week, but what we had to deal with through the majority of the deployment was um, the IED threat, and in particular what we dealt with in uh, northwest Baghdad and then in most of eastern Baghdad, and most of the Shia enclaves, you had what were called uh, explosive, explosively formed penetrators, uh, EFPs, which were, um, yeah, they're essentially at least Iranian tra trained, if not supplied, copper discs. And they're essentially what it turned into was a shape charge. Uh, so you'd pack explosives into a tube, have a concave copper disc on the other side. And when the explosion went off, it would push the copper out um, and create this copper slug that traveled in incredibly fast and would penetrate pretty much any armor that we had. Um, that was one of the issues. The MRAPs were great for underneath, uh, deflecting underneath vehicle explosions, but there was really nothing that we had that could protect against these EFPs. Um, the benefit of it is they are a, it's a precision munition. It's essentially you're shooting something and it has to hit where people are in a vehicle. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that you know, we could defeat those. Um, there's a lot of technical means uh, that we had as far as preventing the, uh, the initiation devices, but they also had to be timed pretty perfectly to, to hit where people were in vehicles. But it was, that was the big, one of the biggest challenges I had that deployment was there was a very, very, very low chance that there were gonna be EFPs out there. It wasn't like some areas of the country where there was IEDs everywhere. But when one did go off and you hit a US truck, the results were pretty much always catastrophic on that vehicle. Um, so that was always in the back of your head. You know, our, we call them TTPs, a tactic, technique, and procedure. When I was, uh, we would drive around and we would go about you know, five to 10 miles an hour because if you don't see this thing, uh, and what they would do is it's, you know, it's kind of this pipe and then they disguise it in uh, like uh, the spray foam and then make it look like a brick. And there's you know, bricks and rub rubbish hanging around all over the side of the roads. So you have to just scan. We drive incredibly slow, scanning the sides of the road, looking for these things and you have possible indicators that they're there. Um, because if you didn't see one, it was gonna be a problem. Uh, and there were, there were ebbs and flows uh, throughout the deployment of when the, the EFP activity was uh, you know, good or bad. Our, our unit was pretty good at, um, as a battalion of, of finding uh, EFPs. And we had a lot of locals that would give us tips on these things as well. Uh, but the EFP threat was definitely uh, not a, a fun thing to deal with. And we also went through a period in early 2008 where we dealt with a lot of uh, rocket attacks on our bases. Um, particularly where I was at, um, FOB Justice in Northwest Baghdad, we took, we had a period, I think it was in April 2008, and you were getting rocketed pretty much every day. Um, we deal with a lot of sandstorms uh, coming in through that time of year, and what the, uh, the militants realize is a lot of our aerial assets, helicopters, other things we had that could see and quickly respond to rocket launches weren't up there. So, they knew that if they launched rockets when it was you know, in a dust storm, pretty much they could get away when they launched the rockets. And they were incredibly accurate with, I mean, I was always surprised because it wasn't like they were using you know, military grade rocket launchers. In a lot of cases, it was welded rails uh, that they'd lay the rocket on, initiate it from there, and they're shooting 10 kilometers away. And I think about the geometry, I was like, wow, these guys are pretty good. <laughs> you know, because they were shooting a great distance. And that's, that takes a toll. Um, you know, when we were taking rockets most every, most every day on the base, uh, you know, because you never know, you're sitting there, you know, browsing the internet or whatnot, and then you hear a rocket come in, and when that happens day in and day out, that was, that was pretty harrowing, uh, and it went on for a long time. That was not fun to deal with at all, so. Did you finally get to deal with the rocket launches? Or? They more or less stopped. Um, and I think it might have just been a, uh, it could have been, you know, the weather started getting better. I think a lot of it was, in my opinion, probably after I had talked about the, the Sadr or the Shia uprisings in late March, I think after they were military defe militarily defeated in that week long uprising, they kind of then went to the rockets um, as a you know, counterattack, if you will. 
uh, whether or not maybe they ran out of rockets. I mean, our, our battalion and U.S. forces as a whole did a very good job at this time of the war of targeting individual uh, insurgent cell leaders and members. So we, there, was getting, there were a lot of them that were getting detained on a nightly basis too. So we had done, uh, if we went into to look at some of the, the targeting we had done of insurgent groups, uh, you know, they lost, or they had a lot of folks to get detained. Um, and we did a very good, um, I had talked, you know, popular support we had from the locals, but we did a very good, what we call information operations. You know, just simple things like we knew who these guys were, so we put up wanted posters all over the place, you know, radio addresses. And, you know, when people saw who these guys were, it had two effects. A, we would get tips from the locals if they were around, and B, a lot of these guys had to go to ground per se because they're like, well, they know who I am, they know what I'm doing, I'm gonna have to go across the river, find another place to bed down. Um, so it was, you know, by summer 2008, a lot of the violence had really subsided. We would see occasional upticks in IED activity, but for the most part, um, by late 2008, when we were getting ready to leave, you know, we had seen most of the violence drop off. And then the other critical aspect of our mission over there was training Iraqi security forces uh, and trying to get them to stand up on their own. Uh, and we were doing a much better job at, on that facet. And that was when I finished the, the PSD job and moved over to the second platoon I led. You know, we did almost exclusive uh, planning patrolling with the Iraqi National Police that were co-located with us. And you know, you saw that unit get a lot better um, over the course of the deployment. Uh, the, Ira the Iraqi National Police were uh, historically very corrupt and tied into the Shia militias. And there's reports of they were sent in some areas, they were essentially armed death squads uh, that worked for the Shia militias and they would go and you know, eradicate Sunni, Sunni neighborhoods. Um, so that was what we kind of worried coming in and working with these guys, but they had just switched over the National Police Unit we worked with. And I found uh, the, the National Police Battalion I worked with was, their soldiers or policemen weren't, weren't the greatest, but they had very good leaders. Um, there was two Iraqi majors that I worked with on a pretty much a daily basis. And you know, they had both fought the entire Iran-Iraq war for the Iraqi army. So they were you know, very experienced militarily. They understood how things needed to be done. They were very willing to help us. Um, they realized you know, we had certain capabilities they didn't have, but we depended on them, especially in going after and targeting uh, some of these insurgent groups. You know, we needed to have local security forces with us because they could better interact with the population, understand what was going on, um, and ultimately, you know, for us, it was also proving to the Iraqi people that their own security forces uh, could take care of them and deal with these threats, you know. So the further and further the deployment went on, we started pulling back more and more and letting them do a lot more of the stuff. And we saw by the end of the deployment, the, the National Police Battalion I worked with, they were going out on their own and finding, you know, enemy weapons caches uh, that, you know, we wouldn't have known were there, but they would find... Uh, you'd see people actually respecting uh, the National Police Unit in the area. And I didn't work that much with the Iraqi army. Uh, other platoons worked with the Iraqi army in our area, but they shared similar sentiments that people had thought that you know, their security forces had gotten much better. Uh, and for us, you know, it was initially in the beginning of the deployment, we would call them partnered operations when you go out with Iraqis. Um, initially, we, would do, we wouldn't have to do that. We did a lot of unilateral, so just US patrols. And by mid-2008, you know, we weren't allowed to do unilateral patrols. We had to go out with partners. And I was fortunate where, you know, we would just, I would plan these operations with the two Iraqi majors. We'd link up with uh, National Police Platoon and we'd just go and, you know, patrol areas. And I think it was for a lot of the, the natives of, or the, the residents of the area, they saw, hey, the Americans are patrolling with these guys. Maybe we can tr trust the National Police because they had had such a negative connotation before with them. Late 2008, uh, when were you sent back to the United States? Uh, late November, I think, 2008. We were originally scheduled for a 15-month deployment, um, and then the surge started going well, the drawdown started happening, so we ended up doing about 14 months and came back right before Thanksgiving 2008 was when our brigade came back. You know, we were replaced, and that was one of our goals 
for our battalion was, hey, we don't want to be replaced. Success is not being replaced by a U.S. force, having this turned over entirely uh, to the Iraqis. We didn't quite succeed in that, but we had come in with a 700-person battalion, and we were replaced by about a 150-person company. So you can see that it started. And then I kept in, I knew some folks from West Point that were in that unit, and you know they continued to close down a lot of these bases because one of the the major tenants of the, the surge in Iraq was moving forces into the population. So getting off the larger bases and putting, we call them either, uh, in Iraq it was either a joint security station uh, or a combat outpost. And you know, these were literally you know, houses that were taken over, barricaded off slightly and platoons operated out of there. Um, and the unit that followed us, you know, they spent most of their time closing down uh, a lot of these outposts, consolidating and handing over responsibility to the, uh, the Iraqi security forces. Before we have you leave Iraq, uh, tell us about a little more about life on base. Um, okay, um, I was fortunate. Uh, I resided on two major bases when I was in Iraq. Uh, I had mentioned before Camp Taji, which is north of Baghdad, which is a pretty huge base. It was a very large uh, Iraqi military base before the uh, the invasion, and uh, so there was, you know, I'd say in the realm of at least ten thousand American forces there. Uh, the Iraqi Air Force was still running out of there, so you know their nascent helicopter capabilities were getting trained out of there, uh, and I would call Taji would be one of those you know, super fobs, if you will. You know they had Burger King, they had you know a post exchange. Um, it was we kind of lived out. One downfall was where our platoon was. The compound was out in the middle of nowhere, um, so it was actually really difficult because we weren't anywhere close to phones or the internet um, or Burger King, so. They were about a mile or two away, but when we were up there, I was doing PSD, and that was essentially, we were on call 24 hours a day, so it wasn't like we could just send guys off, hey, go get Burger King, because if something happened, we would routinely get spun up in the middle of the night, because you know, one of our companies had been attacked, and you know, they had taken some casualties, and the battalion commander wanted to get down there as soon as possible, or they were conducting a raid, or something big happened, and he had to get down there. Uh, so we were always on standby, so it meant it was very difficult for us to get our guys over to where there were phones, internet, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we actually, when we were at Taji, it was easier for us when we would drive to one of the, the company bases in Baghdad, and while we were waiting around, while the colonel was meeting with one of the company commanders, our guys would use the internet that they had at one of these smaller bases, and that was easier than it was at, uh, at Camp Taji. After about two months, our battalion moved its headquarters from Camp Taji down to FOB Justice, which was in Kadamia, um, where I ended up staying the rest of the deployment. Uh, FOB Justice had been the uh, like center of Iraqi intelligence in Baghdad. It was actually where they hung Saddam Hussein over on the national police side. So the base is pretty big, um, and there was a very large Iraqi army portion, a pretty small U.S. portion, and a very large Iraqi national police portion. Um, we had roughly, I think, about 500 U.S on the base, then probably a thousand each of national police and Iraqi army. Um, and I, FOB justice wasn't bad. Uh, you know, a lot of my soldiers, since it was this old Iraqi intelligence building, they actually had, instead of living in tents, they had rooms, they were, you know, seven or eight guys in a room, uh, but they might have a sink or like a, a bathroom or something or a shower in some of the rooms. Um, and they had, in the basement, there was a, the U.S. force had put a pretty nice gym down there. And then what we actually had was a lot of locals um, would come onto the base every day and they ran uh, little shops where they would sell you know, bootleg DVDs and energy drinks and soap and stuff you'd need like that. Um, so pretty much anything we would need, you could get at, uh, at FOB Justice. We paid local Iraqis, they uh, ran the, we had a bunch of washer machines. So you turn in your laundry, they'd wash it. You know, if you bring your ticket a day or two later, you get your laundry back. Um, so it was, it was actually pretty good. The, uh, the food uh, wasn't bad. Uh, I think it was still army rations that we got, but it seemed pretty good. Um, you know, I, I enjoyed FOB Justice because it was big enough where it wasn't one of these tiny little remote. We had one of our platoon bases, uh, not in my company, but one of the other companies, and it was maybe 50 meters by 50 meters. It was tiny, it was horrible. Uh, I couldn't imagine living there. So they would have to come to FOB Justice, you know, to do their laundry, to get on the internet, to do anything. So it wasn't being on one of these huge bases that you hear about, which I never really liked going to because it's just too much going on, but it wasn't completely tiny. So it was this nice balance in between. And when I ended up doing later on in the deployment, the patrols of the National Police, I mean, we just walked out the gate. 
we were in the neighborhood. Um, you know, if we had, you know, bad, if the dinner that we were having that night was bad, we'd just be like, hey, let's go on patrol and go buy falafels on, mm -hmm. out in the town or whatnot, because, you know, we were there, so. Um, well, you mentioned the food. Uh, were you uh, MREs, local food, or? Uh, mostly, we had uh, army rations that army cooks prepared, and they'd have locals help with the serving of it. Um, on operations, you know, one of the missions we had to do that we hated was uh, there was a section of this major highway through Baghdad that had a really bad IED threat. So the entire deployment we had it, within our battalion, a platoon was always sitting out there 24 hours a day. So we'd rotate through. It usually was 12-hour shifts that you did once or twice a week, and you just sat on a highway for 12 hours and watch traffic and look for people putting in IED. So when you're out there, you're eating MREs. Um, usually we ate, uh, if we were on FOB Justice, you'd eat what they have there. And the, the outside uh, outposts had the same thing too. It was, it's not terrible food. Um, and then I ended up eating a lot of local food because uh, I worked for the National Police a lot. Or we'd be at meetings uh, pulling security and just ask you know, the, their security guards, like, hey, can you go buy us some falafels? Um, things like that. And then we ended up, we, you know, we spent a lot of time we would buy food, you know, just when we were out on patrol from local merchants because I thought it was better. Um, I got really sick like once or twice, but then I found that once you get sick once, it get, runs through your system, then you're good to go. So you can, technically, you're, you, we weren't supposed to eat uh, local food because of the health risks associated with it, but you know, our, the majority of our guys enjoyed it, um, you know, and we do it from time to time. It changed things up. Uh, but the food wasn't terrible. I mean, when I was in Iraq, I mean, we had... We had access to ice cream like every day if you wanted ice cream because we had you know freezing our freezer storage ability and one thing that I thought was interesting you know in Baghdad you're really not that far from uh, what was considered Victory Base Complex you know the massive U.S. base at the airport so the resupply was not that difficult you're, I think you know as the crow flies it was maybe seven miles away so we spent a fair amount of time we'd have to go down to meetings because our brigade was based out of there so we'd have to go down to we call it VBC, Victory Base Complex. So either there or the green zone, maybe once or twice a month. And guys like that because then they could go to the, the post exchange there, which are, you, know, you could buy a big screen TV there if you wanted to, it was insane. Um, but they could go get their Burger King, they could buy you know real cigarettes or whatnot instead of you know the cheap ones that they would get, you know, Pall Mall or whatever knockoff brand the Iraqis had. Just like, I don't think these are real cigarettes. Um, so, it was, it was I, I think quality of life wise, it wasn't that bad. You know, FOB Justice, we had a fair amount of phones and internet. Um, and then you'll find our, our communication guys had set it up where we actually had a either wired or wireless network that you had to pay for, uh, but they would run it through you know, a British contractor or something where you could get internet in your room. It would it cost you, you know, $100, $150 a month, but it was better than gonna go wait for one of the seven or eight computers that we had and it wasn't that bad. So it was nice. I was able to keep in touch with home and everything like oh, that. That's good. Let's get you back to the United States just before Thanksgiving. Uh, are you back at Fort Campbell? Yep, I went back to Fort Campbell. Um, shortly after we returned, uh, around Christmas time, we went on a long period of block leave. And then when I came back from block leave, I changed jobs and became uh, the executive officer for our headquarters company. So my job primarily consisted of all of our equipment had been you know, sent through Kuwait on ships and it was receiving all the equipment, making sure it all made back, accounting for everything, figuring out what was broken. It was very tedious, uh, long work, not fun. Um, very, the, you know, the, the executive officer is not a rewarding job at all. It's a ton of work, but you know, nobody really knows if you're doing your job unless you start messing things up and then people know. So you're, you're technically second in command of the company, but all you really worry about is property. And at this point, are you a first lieutenant or still a second? Oh, I, I got promoted to first lieutenant pretty early on, uh, within a month again to Iraq, because we get promoted first lieutenants in automatic at 18 months, I think. So shortly after I got to Iraq, I got promoted to first lieutenant. And then mid-June, I think, after we came back, so in 2009, I got promoted to captain when I was uh, an executive officer. Back then, we were promoting pretty quick to captain because of the war. I think of 35, 36 months is what I get promoted at from time of commission. That is fast. Yeah. You're counting equipment at Fort Campbell. Tell us what happened next. Um, so I came on orders. The, the next thing in an infantry officer's career is to go to uh, what's called the Maneuver Captain's Career Course. Uh, so back to sunny Fort Benning, Georgia again. 
uh, and it's a six month course in basically the things you need to know to be a company commander and then also a battalion staff officer. Um, and so, you know, I had a, when we came back from Iraq, I had a lot of very good friends and the other lieutenants. Uh, we had a lot of really good times, you know, very close uh, social networks. And fortunately, a lot of us went down to Fort Benning at the same time. So we were able to carry that forward when we went down to the career course at Fort Benning. Uh, and then also the career course at Fort Benning wasn't that demanding time-wise. Uh, so you know, we had a fair amount of time to relax and you know, do what you needed to do. Uh, for the six months that we were down there, uh, you know, I learned a great deal about you know, how to be a company commander, whether it's operational planning or logistics, and then some of the less glorious stuff about you know, planning battalion operations and logistics, maintenance, things like that. But it was, excuse me, it was a very, uh, it, was, it was a worthwhile six month uh, period that I had at uh, Fort Benning for the career course. Now we are in going to 2009. You yep. finished at Fort Benning. Tell us what happened next. So I finished down the career course, I think early 2010, February 2010. Uh, early on in the career course, our, uh, our branch manager for infantry branch came down and interviewed to find out where you wanted to go next. Hey, these are the slots that are available. Um, the Army, when it manages infantry officers, uh, you either have light infantry units like the 101st Airborne or the 82nd Airborne, units that essentially are non-vehicle based. Granted, in Iraq or Afghanistan, everyone was using Humvees and MRAPs, but doctrinally, they are not based off of vehicles. Um, the other side is mechanized uh, infantry. So you think of uh, Bradley fighting vehicles or Stryker uh, infantry carrying vehicles. So if you were in a light unit, basically you have to go to a heavy or mechanized unit your second assignment or vice versa. If you're in a heavy unit, you go to a light unit. So I talked with my branch manager uh, who is responsible for putting your next assignment. I wanted to go to a striker infantry unit. Um, the organization of the, the strikers, it's a, an eight wheeled vehicle that carries nine infantrymen. Um, you know, the vehicles can travel upwards of 65, 70 miles an hour. It's a pretty, uh, they were, the strikers came in, I believe in about 2001. And for me, if I had to go to uh, a motorized or mechanized unit, I wanted to go to Strikers versus Bradley's. Bradley's is almost like a tank. Um, you still have guys in the back of a Bradley, but the Striker just always appealed to me. So I requested to go primarily to Striker posts and fortunately was able to get my top choice of uh, duty assignment, which is at uh, Fort Lewis, Washington, uh, with a Striker brigade there. So I found that out probably November 2009 and then in February or March 2010, I did what we call a PCS, a permanent change of station across the country from Fort Benning up to Fort Lewis, Washington. Your first time on the West Coast. It was. It was a, it was a fun drive across the country. And I, oh, you drove. I, huh. Yeah, I had, I had to move my, well, the Army moved most of my things, and uh, then I drove across the country. And then uh, I knew the unit that I was going to was already deployed in Afghanistan. Uh, they had deployed in late 2009. So I was trying to get there. They were gonna redeploy in July 2010, so I wanted to get there as early as I can and try to get, catch the end of that Afghan deployment with the unit. So I ended up getting to Fort Lewis in early March 2010, and by late March, I think I was there for two weeks before I was in Afghanistan, um, joining the unit who had already been there for eight months. Um, so I, I left with a bunch of uh, I can't remember how many of us there were, but there was a fair amount of soldiers and officers that were going, uh, you know, deploying late to augment people that had to come back or whatever the case might be. Uh, so I went through Kandahar Airfield, spent some time there, and found out I was going to be assigned with uh, 2nd Battalion, 1st Infantry Regiment, uh, which was out in the Maywan District, uh, west of Kandahar City. So kind of between uh, Kandahar City and Helmand out in uh, the no man's land along Highway 1 out there was where we were. Uh, and I got assigned out there as an assistant operations officer. Uh, so for those four months, I essentially worked in a tent from about 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Uh, and as you know, fate would have it, I showed up. And uh, my boss at the time, uh, Major Carlson, now Lieutenant Colonel Carlson, was like, oh great, I have another captain. You can plan the redeployment to get us back to the United States. So I had just come from the United States and I was planning to get this unit back to the United States. Um, so for me personally, you know, I left on patrol 
just because my boss wanted us to get out from time to time, maybe four times in those four months. And more, more, normally, you know, it was the nine to nine operational planning, thinking about getting equipment back to the United States, thinking about how we were going to be replaced with the incoming unit. Because interestingly enough, uh, my old unit from the 101st was actually coming to replace us in Afghanistan because this was the beginning of the Afghan surge. So whereas when we left Iraq, you know, battalions were replaced with companies, we were in the exact opposite where companies were getting replaced with battalions, battalions with brigades. So the massive upsurge was happening. So we had a plan, hey, how are we going to get us out of here, get them in, get them to take over the area. And although for me that deployment uh, wasn't very bad, for the area our battalion is at, it was very, uh, we call kinetic, and there was a lot of enemy activity uh, where they were at. So it was kind of weird for me, you know, you're sitting in an air-conditioned tent working on a computer, you know, planning the movement of containers to Oman, you know, to, to get your stuff back to the United States, and then the guys that are out there at the outposts, you know, they're in contact with you know, Taliban day in and day out. Um, so, you know, we like to say in the Army, you know, no, no good plan survives first contact. And I came up with this, this wonderful wizard plan for how we were going to get everybody, you know, and they were all going to fly from their bases to Kandahar and get on airplanes. And then, you know, the first day when we were putting helicopters down to pick guys up at one of the outposts, they started taking, you know, mortar fire where the helicopters were landing. So it's like, well, this plan isn't going to work. So, you know, I had to come up with this, you know, my well-laid plans for three months had uh, gone and fallen apart within, you know, 12 hours of implementation. So we, you know, had to come up with things. But uh, that was an interesting deployment for me just because it's this idea, you know, you're still an infantry battalion, but not everybody's fighting and doing things. You know, I'm sitting in a tent and working 12 hours a day. What had you been told about Afghanistan before you got there? Well, the unit I went to, um, at the time, it was uh, 5th Striker Brigade, 2nd Infantry Division. They had had a, they were the first Army Striker Brigade to go to Afghanistan. Uh, and they were originally scheduled to go to Iraq, and then they got redirected to Afghanistan pretty late in their training cycle. And they, when they were in Afghanistan, there was not a lot of U.S. forces in southern Afghanistan. And they had a very difficult, uh, they took a lot of casualties the first few months there. Um, they had a very steep learning curve because they were, they went on, you know, some offensive operations into areas no one had been in years, and you know um, the Taliban in the area was ready for them. And you know we had one battalion lose, you know, I think upwards of within the first two months, 20 soldiers uh, killed in action. Uh, so, you know, they, I had known that there was some things in the Army Times um, publication that was written about like, how horrible this deployment was. So when I found out that I was going to that unit, I was like, oh, this could be interesting. Um, but I knew that they had had, they had, had issues. Um, you know, the, the Stryker platform, similar when we talked to the Humvees, uh, the Stryker was also a flat bottom vehicle and they had performed pretty well in Iraq. Um, but when they went to Afghanistan, they were hitting you know, massive IEDs. You know, there was one instance uh, in our brigade before I got there where, you know, a Stryker got hit, all seven soldiers inside were killed um, because it was this flat bottom that wasn't designed for that. Um, Interestingly, if you fast forward to my most recent deployment, they had retrofitted the strikers, which was called the double V-hole. So even though it looked the same, the way that they had redone the inside, it upgraded the armor package on the bottom to prevent against these type of strikes. But at the time, that wasn't there. Um, so it was, it was a very interesting deployment, uh, the first one in Afghanistan, because you know, the regional command south uh, headquarters that ran uh, the area operations I was, it was still a British headquarters. The unit to our east was Canadian. You had Marines to our west. I think it was Norwegian to the north. So it was very multinational, NATO-esque. Uh, and there was a lot of, I think, unity of command issues. Um, you know, the U.S. forces knew that this upsweep, uh, upsweep was coming of U.S. forces when the, when the surge began, but it hadn't really started yet. And I mean, my take when I first got to Kandahar was kind of like, wow, this is kind of a mess. Um, compared to what I had experienced in Iraq. Uh, you know, I remember vividly when we were at Kandahar Airfield doing some of our, you know, there's a, a battery of training you have to do once you get into country. It'll give you very recent uh, IED examples and things like that. So you'll go through these training exercises. And I was on this, you know, little shuttle bus out to the training lane with some of the lieutenants that had come out with me. And they're like, sir, is that the outside of uh, the base? I'm like, no, there's no way. It's a chain link fence. This is Kandahar Airfield. Because in Iraq, you know, we have these massive concrete blast walls. 
And lo and behold, I mean, the chain link fence at the time was the perimeter of Kandahar Airfield. It's like, wow, I'm, take me back on that one. So it was, it was a very different uh, experience than what I had realized in Iraq. Um, and you know, at the time, 2009, 2010, it was, a, uh, it was a different war, I think, than what we saw in 2010, 2011. Uh, in Afghanistan, as you know, the the surge started happening there because it was just very resource constrained uh, in 2010. Uh, you know, most there were still a lot more forces in Iraq than there were in Afghanistan. So, it was uh, it was a very interesting, uh, short but interesting deployment for me. Mm -hmm. And how long were you there in your first deployment? Fourth de my first deployment in Afghanistan, I was only there for four months. So compared to the 14 I had done in Iraq, it was well, this is pretty easy. Um, and then we came back from Afghanistan, and I spent about a year in the same job uh, as an assistant S3. And once we got back to Fort Lewis, uh, you know, when units come back from deployments, a lot of the, most of the people that have been there for a while, they move to another assignment. You get a bunch of new people in. So I was responsible for planning and coordinating all the training that the battalion did for about the next year, from July 2010 until March 2011. And in March 2011, I took command of a Bravo Company, 2nd Battalion, 1st Infantry Regiment. Uh, so as it became a Striker Rifle Company commander in uh, March 2011. Tell us what happened next. Um, so we knew we would be going back to Afghanistan. Uh, the Army had just recently, you, know, you often hear people talk about dwell time and how long people have between the deployments. We knew that because the commitments in Iraq were going away, we were gonna have about two years of dwell time, so that gave me about a year from the time I took command to the time I knew we'd be going to Afghanistan. So we trained, uh, we did a lot of training. I took command. Uh, one of the challenges with Fort Lewis is that the training area there is not very conducive to uh, motorized vehicle training. So we actually would have to drive six hours out to Yakima Training Center uh, east of the Cascade Mountains, which is this desert. It actually replicates Afghanistan pretty well. Um, so we'd go out there routinely. I believe right after I took command, we went out there for about a two-week exercise. Later in the summer, we went out there for a month. Um, so I would balance basically between doing you know, the training of our soldiers in individual tasks and small unit tasks, and then we'd do these larger exercises uh, out at Yakima. And then in November 2011, similar to when I went to Fort Polk when I was the 101st, we went to Fort Irwin, California which is the National Training Center, similar mission uh, of Fort Polk, Louisiana. Just, it's a, it's a desert out, you know, it's out in the Mojave Desert. So we went there to do our mission rehearsal exercise for Afghanistan. Uh, and this time as a company commander, you know, I was responsible for, uh, you know, our training focus was on, hey, we're going to Afghanistan, this is what we need to do to get ready. Um, at that time, I think we thought we were gonna go to Afghanistan in like February, so about two or three months after that, uh, the National Training Center rotation. But we went out to the National Training Center, um, trained on multiple things. Uh, you know, I found the, the training, one of the major qualms I had with this rotation is that we knew we were gonna have to uh, be working with and training Afghan Army or Afghan police. And it was just something that wasn't able to be very well replicated. Uh, and I, f I felt that you know this was late in the war, we know this is what we're doing uh, this should be a focal point of what we're training. And I understand we're not going to have, you know, an actual Afghan platoon to train with, but even with U.S. role players, I just, I found it was, you know, kind of very limited in its scope. And it was kind of frustrating because I knew what our guys were going to be going into in Afghanistan when it came, uh, based off my experiences working with the National Police in Iraq. And I had known that the 2010 deployment, most of them didn't really work with the Afghan army because it really was almost non-existent. So working with host nation security forces is going to be important. And I felt like we really kind of didn't get that out of the, the National Training Center. The other thing that was missing was the area we were going into in Afghanistan uh, was inundated with these combat outposts. So, uh, you know, essentially every platoon in your company was living on its own outpost. And when we were at the National Training Center, you know, our whole battalion was on one base. So these platoon leaders never got the experience of, hey, I have to think through the defense plan of my little base here, uh, let alone the ideas that, you know, the simple things that would haunt us when we went back to Afghanistan, like, you know, paying contracts to keep the people that come to deal with the Porter Johns and the food and everything like that. Because when you're 
a new platoon leader. I couldn't have imagined doing it. I didn't have to deal with in Iraq, but when we went to Afghanistan in 2012, they all had their own you know, small combat outposts that you're responsible for multiple facets, and we weren't able to replicate that at all at uh, the National Training Center, which I thought was kind of frustrating. And I understand you know, you're in a resource-constrained environment, but I felt you know, we could have done a better job as a unit because um, we knew what we were getting into, and I don't think did a great job tailoring our training uh, to what we knew we were coming in on. So we learned a lot out of the rotation, um, but I think there were definitely some things that we missed uh, going that you know, would have helped for Afghanistan. And when were you sent back? In late March or early, I think it was early April 2012, uh, our battalion went to the Argandab River Valley, which is just north of Kandahar City, uh, slightly northeast of where I was the first time in Afghanistan. Um, and this was interesting. Uh, when I had talked about when our unit was over there in 2009, 2010, and that unit had taken a lot of casualties, one of our sister battalions, my company, uh, Bravo Company, had been attached to that battalion. So a lot of our guys had been to the Argandab before and had this very negative connotation of how horrible it was in 2009. So there was some there was some consternation with a lot of our veterans because they were like, I don't like, you know, going back to that place, I was there before. It was really bad fighting. This is not good. Um, interestingly, we got there and the, the unit there before us had done a great job uh, and it was quiet. I mean, there was not much going on for enemy activity at all. Uh, what I found to be the case is it was more dealing with tribal and village infighting and politics uh, really two sides, yeah, maybe three sides of my job as a company commander, at least initially in Afghanistan, were uh, balancing and playing mediator in these tribal fights and squabbles or village squabbles that were going on, uh, mentoring and training the Afghan army, but also getting them to stop being dependent on U.S. supplies, which they had been for years. And then the, the third leg would be, you know, kind of keeping our guys afloat because we were sp initially when my company came into the Argandab, we were responsible for five combat outposts. So my company headquarters was there with a platoon on one, but for those other four, they were running their own combat outpost. And you know, you're, most, even the senior non-commissioned officers had never been through this experience before. And it was little stupid things. It was, uh, you know, making sure that you did the contracts correctly uh, to pay the guys that come and deal with your sanitation because they'd be local contractors that would do that stuff, you know. Our guys went through crash courses to get legally qualified as contracting officers, but they weren't really prepared for how to deal with little stuff like that. Um, you know, making sure that you know you ordered your food properly, so you know you didn't come into the oh we're out of food today and it's not coming until next week. Uh, you know this, and then the ba obviously, you know you're on these small bases. You have to plan for uh, um, you know force protection. So you've got you know say four guard towers. And you'd say most of these bases were roughly 30 U.S. soldiers, maybe 30 Afghans. Well, you know, we had, it always took about nine to 10 guys to man the guard towers and the gates and everything. You would have another nine to 10 that were out patrolling. And so at least, you know, nine to 10 that are back actually getting rest. So the, the operational cycle that they were on was incredibly demanding um, initially when we came into country. So it was this, for me, it was exhausting, you know, listening to a lot of this, what I found to be frankly, you know, semantic quabbling or squabbling between these village elders over stuff that you know went back decades and you know long family feuds and so and so did this with the mujahideen and that's why we'll never like him and trying to do that uh dealing with uh afghan security forces that were less than pleased that we weren't giving them gas anymore and things like that uh because they had you know for the previous few years the U.S. had given them pretty much anything they wanted. Oh, you guys need air conditioners for your tent? Sure. Uh, you know, gas? Sure. Here's no problem because we had to get them into the fight. Uh, and then in 2012, we're getting ready to leave. You know, the, the 2014's on the, the horizon. And, hey, these guys need to come up with what we refer to as Afghan sustainable solutions. You know, can they really sustain air conditioning in their tents when we pull out and our generators go away? No, they can't. Uh, you know, can we continue to give them however many liters of gas a month no, we can't, because they actually have a system. You know, for Ministry of Defense, it, the gas and everything is actually there um, somewhere high up. But as it goes down the chain, it you know gets siphoned off here, there, everywhere else. So then when it comes down, you know, uh, to poor Lieutenant Aziz or whoever, you know, 
He's like, well, my truck has no gas. We can't go on patrol. And it's like, well, maybe we'll walk. And then they'll try to come up with an excuse. So it was very difficult um, in ways I didn't imagine because, as I had mentioned, it wasn't a very uh, hostile or kinetic deployment. There wasn't, we dealt with, uh, there was, in the northern area of the sector, there was a fair amount of, uh, there were some places where there was a fair amount of enemy activity, uh, but nothing like they had seen in 2010. Um, and you know the, the Argandob district was started to be looked at as this great success story because in 2010, 2011, it was you know the, the, probably one of the worst places in Afghanistan, and then it had become this case study of oh wow, you know, counterinsurgency worked here, and why is the Argandob different, and why is it working? So it was it was rewarding, but it was also a really frustrating uh, first few months of the deployment, and then as the the drawdown was going on, we continually. Uh, would be moving forces, so we kept changing bases. And originally, I was in the my force was all on the northern side of the district, and then we moved to all the western side of the river. So you'd have to uproot, move, get to learn new Afghan counterparts, new villager, new village elders. Um, so it was hard, I thought, to make you know lasting relations with village elders, uh, with Afghan uh, partners, um, and it was also tough just continuously moving. Uh, a fair deal of the time and learning in you know, a lot of these villages there's a there was a great deal of uh, you had to have a basic understanding of the history of the the power players in them if you wanted to be effective and know what some of their motives were because of what had happened two three fifteen years ago and realize that this guy is always going to be striving you know to screw over this other guy that he hates because they took his water rights or something along those lines so it was a very I thought a very academic uh, much more so than I expected exercise and have an understanding of anthropology uh, in some regards of understanding how these tribes worked and why this tribe hated this tribe. And uh, it was very challenging. Um, so, and then there was, you know, trying to reduce our support to the Afghan security forces, but also have them go out and do more on their own. And we saw, I had some great Afghan army counterparts um, that you know, U.S. forces would pull out of their base; they'd be left behind, and they stayed ex incredibly effective. Um, you know, very professionally, did a great job. Uh, the areas that they were responsible for really respected the work that they did. Um, but then I also worked with the national police, their Afghan national police, and also the Afghan local police. And then you had this full gamut of, uh, you know, reactions. Uh, you know, you see a lot of the policemen were very what we would call corrupt. They don't see it as being as corrupt as you know we would consider in America if. You know, the police just stopped you on the road and demanded money. Um, it's somewhat acceptable in Afghanistan, but they're at a certain level, uh, they would cross the line, then the people would get upset. So it was, it was frustrating for me because you want to go over there and help, but at that point in the war, we were, uh, you know, we were, we pretty much stopped doing construction and development projects. So you're only able to do so much, you know, had it been two or three years earlier, you know, hey, we're working with the district uh, council and we're going to, you know, build a bridge here or a well here. You know, we stopped doing that stuff. So you had a lot of people, the sentiment that I experienced with a lot of the Afghans at that point were kind of like, well, what are you guys really doing here then? Uh, and I was like, well, we're trying to train the Afghan army. But uh, it was difficult because you wanted to help, but you were extremely limited in what we could do because of the resource constraints by the end. So... And how long were you on your second deployment? So my second deployment uh, was a nine-month deployment. I came over in April. In November, I took command of the battalion's headquarters company, which was a whole different set of challenges. So I went from being what was what we call a, a battle space owner, someone that actually you know is responsible for an area of the district and you know the security and the mentorship. In November, I took command of a second company, the battalion's headquarters company. Uh, so I was at the battalion headquarters, which was co-located with the district government center, with the uh, district police uh, center, and with the Afghan army battalion headquarters. Um, so I didn't have anybody in the, we call it a headquarters headquarters company, HHC. And HHC, I didn't really have any platoons that went out and did things for me. You know, I had a scout platoon, but they worked for the battalion and did what the battalion told them to do as far as like focus targeting. Uh, so me and my, my first sergeant's job was to run this monstrosity that was the district's police center where you had about, I think we had about 150, 180 Americans there, about 300 national police, 300 Afghan army, plus the district government center, and nobody there liked each other very much. Oh, yeah, I had, had, 
I had very good experience working with, uh, when I was on the other side of the river with Bravo Company, um, you know, in the summer of 2012 across Afghanistan, there was this really big problem with what's called green on blue, where you had Afghan security forces killing Americans. Um, whether they were Taliban infiltrators, or it was a personal feud, you know, it differs from case to case, but it led to a lot of changes in how we did business. Um, you know, I would go, I used to routinely go to the other side of my, uh, my compound and meet with the Afghan company commander of their police unit just by myself, you know, no weapon or anything like that. And, uh, you know, it eventually got to the point where, you know, you cannot meet with the Afghans uh, until we implemented, you know, they've done all these background checks on all their soldiers. And we, it was unfortunate, you know, because we ended up, you know, throwing up barriers where we used to have tents next to each other where we lived. We had to like build barriers. And I was blessed at my, when I, where I was when that first happened to have, although I was there with both Afghan police and Afghan army uh, units, the commanders were very mature, and you know when I called them in, and had to tell them, "Hey, this is what's happening." They're like, "Hey, we watch TV. We know what's happening. We know this isn't your decision." And the other thing I was fortunate with there is that uh, in the army and the police weren't huge fans of each other, so like we gave the police their own compound, the army their own compound, and since they didn't have to deal with each other anymore, they thought it was the greatest thing ever. They're like, "Oh, the Afghan army guys weren't laying on the grass talking on their cell phones all night. This was great. You know, they stayed to themselves." So we had a very, I thought, a very good as best relationship we could have to overcome these challenges of, hey, I trust you guys and I don't think any of your soldiers are gonna kill my soldiers, but this is what's happened in the country. Uh, when I went to the headquarters, headquarters company, that was not exactly the mentality there. Um, there was a lot of, uh, there's a lot of ill will between the Americans and the Afghan police there. Um, I don't know all the history behind it, but we actually had before I went there, you know, Afghan, uh, police officer had sexually assaulted a female American soldier there at the gates. I mean, just bad things were happening. There were verbal altercations, physical altercations. And so you're looking through this lens of, you see what's happened throughout the country and like this place is prime for something like this to happen. So uh, me and my first sergeant had to work a lot with trying to manage just tensions there and uh, you know, make sure that we could coexist with the police. Cause again, this went back to, we were no longer giving them resources. So when we used to be giving them resources and let them do this, that, and the other thing, they didn't mind so much. But now that we were, you know, in a lot of shapes, you know, squatters on their base because we weren't doing as much supporting them was kind of their site or uh, the way that they saw it, it became a very big challenge uh, managing those relationships uh, because, you know, the battalion, our battalion commander would have a good relationship with their battalion commander. Um, and you know everything was great between the two of them, but then when you dealt with like the interactions with the soldiers, uh, you know just little. It was too small of an area for that many people to be together of different culture. It was a one of the bigger challenges I've had uh, in my time as a, as a com or as an officer. Period, because they were just not good solutions. And I had come from a place where we had been able to work relationships and coexist very well, and it was frustrating to not be able to really make it happen over there. So I was. I only spent about two months, because uh, we ended up redeploying in January 2013, so I only spent about two, two and a half months over there at the District Police Center, but it was a very tense uh, two to three months. And it was, just, you know, it was just a small base that because the District Center was there, that's where it had to be, and it was on the side of this mountain, and it was not very defensible. Uh, and you know, then you have a bunch of, if it was all the battalion headquarters soldiers who do all the mundane, you know, the personal administrative and the communications, and the intelligence stuff, you know, they're the unsung heroes of the unit. So in a lot of cases, their morale is kind of low. So keeping those guys, you know, involved and not getting too down on themselves. And you know, one of the big things me and my first sergeant did is we made a huge deal out of Thanksgiving and made it, you know, into this pretty big, almost, you know, celebration where we had, we had a small shooting range and we had like a turkey shoot, like target competition up there, basketball tournament, like boxing tournament, a huge, meal uh, and try to give all the guys and the girls that were on the base an opportunity to kind of relax and uh, you know unwind because it was both between us and the Afghans then I think just internally with the US force there it was a tense situation because I think when you put soldiers on a small base there's only 30 of them and they're going out and they're patrolling every day they see purpose in what they're doing whereas these guys are working in an office and they're processing paperwork and they're getting mail and they're doing all the stuff that nobody cares about unless it goes wrong so I know it was difficult for, for the staff soldiers to go through that. So that took us through our redeployment in roughly uh, January 2013. I think it was one of the last ones out uh, when we left 
in 2013. And where were you sent? I went back to Fort Lewis, Washington. Um, and I had been at that for about the previous six months, I had been looking for what I was going to do when I finished up company command. Um, so I had done a thing, uh, a retention uh, incentive program when I was at West Point, where instead of doing the standard five-year uh, commitment, I agreed to do an eight-year commitment. But at the, the caveat on that was at the completion of my company command, if I still want to stay in the Army, the Army would send me to any grad school I could get into. Um, so while I was in Afghanistan, I was applying to grad schools. Uh, I ended up applying to several schools, got into the Fletcher School at Tufts, and decided that was really where I wanted to go. And they were great because they had early uh, notifications. I found out in November when I was in Afghanistan that I had gotten in, which was nice. Mm -hmm. um, so we came back to Fort Lewis, uh, and the same process is all, you know, a lot of soldiers started leaving, going to other bases, new soldiers came in, and you just start going through that cycle of, you know, training new soldiers uh, on individual tasks and start building up to, to collective tasks. So we spent that summer, uh, the, ROTC did their annual summer training at Fort Lewis for a decade, so we got tasked for about a month and a half to support that and run the land navigation lanes for the cadets and uh, do some other things. Um, but we just went back to the normal training cycle until I ended up leaving in August 2013 to come out here to the Boston area to, to go to grad school uh, at Fletcher. So, and then I've been there for the last year now. And what are you majoring in? I'll get a master's degree in law and diplomacy, but I focus on security studies and uh, international negotiation and conflict resolution. So it's a, uh, it's a great program. I enjoy kind of the break from the Army. I miss a lot of the aspects of the Army, um, but it's nice to, you know, it's such a great program with such an international dimension of student body that you get to meet people from all over the world with different viewpoints and have the time to actually think through, you know, what I've done with Iraq and Afghanistan and over the last, you know, eight plus years now to, to have some time to think about, well, how does this fit into the big picture geostrategically of what we're doing and what's going on? And are you still in active service with the Army? I'm still active duty, yes. Okay. So I will owe them a long time um, for grad school since they're paying for me to go to grad school. I intend to keep it a career at this point in time so it doesn't bother me. Um, I like the Army. I want to keep doing this. Uh, and I figure, you know, have the opportunity to kind of be out of the Army for two years go to grad school. My family's close by, so I can see my mom, my brother, my niece. Uh, it's a nice change of pace. Mm -hmm. I'll, uh, I'll graduate this upcoming May, and then I'll go to Army uh, Command General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. So yeah, it'll be about, you know, with the two years at Tufts and then another year at Fort Leavenworth, it's kind of a long time away from the Army, um, or at least the operational Army, mm -hmm. um, you know, before I move on to wherever my next assignment after that will be, so. And of course, uh, I've, in speaking with some of fellow Iraq, Afghanistan veterans, uh, they've been talking about the first thing they realized when they got home, they could see green again. Yep. Now, coming home, uh, coming home is always, it's always tricky, I think. You know, I, I personally, I had, I had a tough time coming back from Iraq. It was just, you spend 14 months someplace else where you're doing life and death decisions day in and day out. And then when you come back, there's a lot of trivialness in you know day-to-day -day life. Even as an you know an active duty army soldier, it was always you know frustrating. For instance, you know as a platoon leader, you're able to take out 18 soldiers and go patrol and you know risk your lives and you know possibly get killed. And then you come back and you can't run a rifle range where nobody's moving. You know, you're just standing there and shoot. You need to have a captain or somebody running. You know, so this you know the the loss of almost autonomy. It's difficult to deal with. And then I think at a, a more uh, internal level, you know, you, I felt at least in Iraq that each and every day we made a difference in what we were doing there. And then you come back and it's like, you're not making a, or at least you don't feel like you're making the same amount of difference. I mean, I will, uh, I, it's frustrating for me to see, you know, what's happening in Iraq now because I will go to my grave feeling that what we did made a difference at the time and made it a better place for, you know, the people in Northwest Baghdad. And to see what's happening now, it's definitely frustrating. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it goes into coming back and all of a sudden you can drive and you haven't done that in 14 months and you know, mm. it's, it's a long time. So my most, the two Afghan deployments, the only being four and nine months, nine months I thought was about a perfect length for a deployment. Um, because you had enough time to get in to really get to know the area and then 
to have a good understanding of what was going on, but then you start leaving right around the time when it starts turning into Groundhog's Day. Whereas you, know, you do 14 months, you know, you start hitting the same holidays twice. Uh, you know, you're like, oh, we're here for, we've been here for a year. We're going to be here for another five mm -hmm. months. It's a long time. Uh, so that was, that was definitely tricky. Mm -hmm. Being a Massachusetts native, um, of course, I, I, I take it you've gotten the bonus. I have, yep. Mm -hmm. And what do you think about the, the veterans programs in Massachusetts? I think uh, they're very good. Um, Massachusetts is always somewhat tricky, I think, when it comes to, to veteran stuff, because it is a pretty small uh, portion of the population, especially in these wars that is served. Um, and it's important, I think, that we keep veterans, particularly of Iraq and Afghanistan, connected to their communities when they come back. I, mean, I think there's a lot of misinformation that exists out there. Whenever you see something happen with uh, you know, veterans that go off the deep end and there's this quick rush to paint, well, everyone that went to Iraq and Afghanistan has PTSD or the like. And it, it's unfortunate because you know, the vast majority of people don't, and if they do, they deal with it very well. But I worry, you know, I see it in an area like Somerville, there's just not a lot of Iraq and Afghanistan vets. There's a fair amount, you know, Vietnam, Korea, not so much World War II, but it's difficult for the younger generation to, uh, to kind of you know, integrate with that veteran community. And that's why it's important, I think, for the veterans community to, uh, to have organizations. You know, one of the organizations that I spend a fair amount of time with out in Boston is uh, uh, there's a, my, my shameless plug for uh, Team Red, White, and Blue is centered around uh, enrich, enriching the lives of veterans through physical activity and social ties. So we'll do a lot of you know, 5Ks, uh, runs in Boston. It's a nationwide group, but it's good because it's an area where, say if I, you know, say I had come back from Iraq the first time and chose to gut out and lived in Somerville, and I don't know any other veterans. You know, it's, I even, as you know, a captain, in grad school had a difficult time because all of a sudden you don't have people that have been through like experiences that you can talk with and really understand. So that's why I think it's important to have organizations uh, like Team RWB that try to bring veterans together but also get them tied to their community. Uh, one of the things I've always found impressive with Team RWB is there's a fair amount of never have served you know, civilians from the community that just want to be involved and try to help. Um, and that's very important because uh, if we don't do that, you know, you run the risk of people, you know, going to the far extreme. You know, the stats are, I think, 22 veterans a day commit suicide, and that's, you know, that's a national tragedy. Um, but Boston, especially Boston, has got some great organizations. I mean, the, the Red Sox Foundation and MGH have the Home Base Program, which is a great program that provides, you know, treatment for uh, those with uh, traumatic brain injury, PTSD, and the like, free of charge. Uh, to those those returning members, I know some former service members that use those facilities and those services, and say it's an absolutely great program to have. So, I mean, I'm proud to be a, a Massachusetts veteran, um, but I do think it is it's a small it's a smaller community than some states. Liam, given your future plans, do you think you're going to be deployed to the Middle East again? I don't. Um, I say that optimistically and hoping that you know we don't wind up back there. It's you know the last several months have been a little different than I think we thought they were going to play out. Um, so I'm optimistic, and I say you know when I left Afghanistan the last time, I was pretty. It was weird. I was like, wow, I don't think I'm ever going to be coming back here again. And for a while, that seemed inconceivable. Um, I optimistically say, hopefully not, um, but. You know, it's possible. Will it be in a role like what I've experienced in Iraq and Afghanistan? Hopefully not. Maybe in a, you know, a train and assist role uh, like what we're seeing with uh, you know, the limited use of uh, division headquarters elements in Iraq right now and the, the like. But I'm optimistic when I say hopefully not. Um, you know, I think that, I don't know, we'll see. Um, I hope not. <laughs> Well, Liam Walsh, we thank you so much for coming and taking part in the Natick Veterans Oral History Thank Project. you so very much. Okay. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay.